Uh, welcome to this podcast by the Grupo de Estudios Venezuela, Estados Unidos, housed within the School of History at the Universidad de los Andes in Merida, Venezuela. We are an academic group that focuses on research and dissemination of academic studies on relations between Venezuela and the United States. I'm Dr. Michael Tarver, a member of the group and professor of history at Arkansas Tech University in Russellville, Arkansas. Here with me this afternoon in the Unraveled studio is the historian Brian Wilson, who is also a whiz at creating podcasts and uh, is a, a guru in several of the martial arts. This afternoon, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Gustavo Sacedo Avila, Associate Professor within the Department of Economic and Administrative Sciences at the Universidad Simón Bolívar in Caracas, Venezuela. Joining us this afternoon from Amherst, Massachusetts, Dr. Sacedo Avila is the author of several outstanding works, including the book that we are going to discuss today, titled Venezuela, Campo de Batalla de la Guerra Fria, that is, Venezuela Battleground of the Cold War. The work was the winner of the 2016-17 Rafael Maria Barat History Prize, awarded jointly by the Venezuela National Academy of History and the Bancarib Foundation for Science and Culture. Good afternoon, Dr. Salcedo, and welcome to our podcast. Good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here, uh, and thank you both for the effort that you're making. Uh, yes, and I'm glad to be talking about uh, the book about Kennedy, Eisenhower, and Venezuela. Well, thank you, and we, uh, we're excited to, uh, to have you discuss your work with us. I'll start off with, in your work on Venezuela and the Cold War, you argue that Venezuela occupied a central place during the Cold War when fears of hemispheric security intensified. Specifically, on page 28 of your book, you noted that Venezuela was, quote, one of the major battlefields of the Cold War in Latin America. Can you please discuss that issue and tell us why and how Venezuela occupied such a position? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, well, I would say regarding Venezuela becoming one of the main battlefields of the Cold War, um, essentially I will start by saying that that is uh, a word that I took from a meeting, a private meeting that was held in January of 1961 between uh, the then elect president, uh, John F. Kennedy, and his Latin American task force that he had nominated uh, around the month of uh, November, uh, by the end of the year 1960. Uh, and this um, task force Latin America, they presented their work to uh, Kennedy and the introduction that uh, essentially Adolf Burley, who was one of the persons who was leading this project, as well as Ted Sorensen, uh, essentially they told Kennedy that Venezuela was one of the main battlefields of the Cold War at that time, uh, around 1961. So how did this come about? How was it that Venezuela was dragged uh, into the Cold War uh, at, uh, at that time? Well, essentially, uh, I would say that there were two uh, factors that made Venezuela um, so important for the interest of the United States. On the one hand, it had a great economic uh, value for the uh, national interest of the United States. Uh, we all know that Venezuela since 1928 was one of the main, was the world's main oil exporter, um, a, a primacy that it would uh, essentially hold until 1970 when some of the countries in the Middle East will surpass Venezuelan uh, oil exports, okay? Uh, so this made Venezuela a strategic country for the United States. We know also that during the Second World War, it played uh, an important role in this regard, especially in 1944, um, when uh, according to some uh, data, 
around 60% of the fuel used by the Allies during the Second World War came from Venezuela. We know also that during the Korean War and the Suez Crisis, Venezuela also lent a hand uh, to the United States in those crises and conflicts. So this uh, is an issue that made Venezuela special uh, and I would say unique from the point of view of Latin America. Um, there was a famous speech that the then Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, he gave in March of 1958, where he pointed out the main um, trade partners of the United States at that time. And he essentially pointed out that to the north, there was Canada, to the east, there was the United Kingdom. To the west, they had uh, Japan. And to the south of the United States, there was Venezuela. And he pointed out uh, this fact, uh, the importance and the centrality of oil in the relations uh, with the United States. Uh, so from this point of view, in the 1960s, approximately 65% of all the oil imported by the U.S. came from Venezuela. At this time, Venezuela was also one of the main trading partners of the United States. By 1958, it was the third trading partner of the United States. And later, a few years later, it fell to the fifth um, uh, ranking uh, to the fifth place as a trading partner of the United States. Approximately trade was around two billion dollars uh, at that time, okay? Uh, so I describe in my book that a situation of high interdependence existed between Venezuela and the United States uh, at that time, something that uh, right now uh, uh, does not exist, uh, this situation of high interdependence. Uh, as I mentioned, 65% of the oil imported by the U.S. at that time came from Venezuela. If we see, for example, by the year 2015, only 9% of total U.S. oil imports will come from Venezuela. So, so that is like a huge a difference that we can appreciate. Another great difference is that in 1958, around 50,000 U.S. citizens lived in Venezuela. Um, and that is something that we don't find uh, today. Uh, at that time, in the early 1960s, that was one of the biggest concentrations of U.S. citizens outside of the United States, okay? Uh, and in the, in, from another regard, from another point of view also, which is, of course, related to all that I have been uh, speaking about, essentially U.S. private investment uh, in Venezuela amounted to almost like $3 billion. Uh, this was the highest uh, amount uh, in the world, only uh, second to Canada. That is, U.S. private investment uh, was highest in Canada, and then in second place, Venezuela was the country where most U.S. Uh, investments were located. Uh, so this gives um, a perspective on the importance of Venezuela, why Venezuela was an important player in Latin America and uh, in the Cold War. Okay, the second element, uh, besides the economic element that I just talked about, that I just mentioned, will be the political element. Uh, during the Cold War, especially after um, the victory of the Cuban Revolution in January of 1959, we will have essentially Fidel Castro, Castro come to power and very rapidly turn the Cuban revolution towards um, a communist uh, and a socialist, a Marxist socialist uh, revolution. Uh, and Cuba will essentially uh, 
place its eyes on Venezuela as one of its prime targets, okay? Here we have to also understand a very interesting fact that there is like an organic relation in uh, between the Cuban Revolution and Venezuela, okay? Uh, Venezuela was to a big point, to a certain point, responsible for the victory of the Cuban Revolution uh, and of Fidel Castro. Uh, we have uh, in the late 1950s, Acción Democrática, uh, the main party uh, led by Romulo Betancourt, they were in exile, they were not in power in Venezuela at that time. They were trying to unseat the dictatorships that were in the Caribbean region, not only in Venezuela, but they were also helping uh, the Cubans free themselves from the uh, dictatorship of Batista. Uh, from that point of view, Acción Democrática from Costa Rica sent weapons to uh, the Cubans in order to fight Batista. They sent weapons to the Autentico Party, uh, the Cuban Autentico Party, but they also sent weapons to the Sierra Maestra, okay? Uh, and it's important to know that once Venezuela uh, freed itself from the dictatorship of Marcos Perez Jimenez, Venezuela became like a hub of uh, exile groups uh, from all of Latin America who went to Venezuela to ask for help, to ask for aid, in order to overthrow their own dictatorships. This happened for Cuba. The Cuban exiles operated from Venezuela. They received weapons from Venezuela and they received money and finance from Venezuela. So this is an interesting thing that I, uh, I think it's also like important to put into the broader picture. Uh, the fact that Acción Democrática its foreign policy essentially was to a certain point responsible for the victory um, of uh, Fidel Castro in Cuba. They were also to a certain point responsible to the victory of the Sandinistas 20 years later uh, in 1979. So um, that is interesting, interesting that the left wing uh, moderate party actually through what could be arguably considered mistakes, essentially lent a hand to this more uh, extremist left-wing left governments uh, to come to power in Cuba and later in Nicaragua, as I mentioned, okay? Uh, so it's important, essentially, the United States realized that through this great link and relation between uh, Cuba and Venezuela, essentially they also wanted to intervene and to help Venezuela not fall under the sphere of influence of communism. We know uh, that uh, starting from 19, at the end of 1960 and at the beginning of 1961, Venezuela started to form it's guerrilla groups, okay? So Venezuela was a country that fell uh, at that time um, in the conflict uh, of the Cold War. It manifested this through guerrilla movements um, and Fidel Castro was intent on capturing Venezuela and that is why the United States lent a hand also in order to save Venezuela from becoming communist. I, I, I might, I can add one final thing in this regard, uh, that it, it also places Venezuela as an interesting case, because when we study U.S. Latin American relations during the Cold War, we usually remember the United States intervening in order to uphold, to support, military dictatorships in order to forestall the danger of communism. Well, the case of Venezuela is interesting because it's a case where we see the United States supporting 
and upholding democracy uh, in a Latin American country. So that is a, a, an important case where the US helped and aided uh, democracy in Latin America uh, in its fight against communism. And as you know, of course, Acción Democrática was not trusted for a good portion of the pre-Kennedy years by the United States government because of, of the things that, that, that you talked about, that there was always a concern that it was, that it was too far left. Um, on uh, your, your book also explores the relationship between President John Kennedy in the United States and President Romulo Bethencourt in, in, in Venezuela. Can you discuss their, their personal relationship and then give us your thoughts as to why that personal relationship was, was so important to the bettering of relations be between our two countries, I especially in light of a, of a comment that you make on, on page 188 of your book, where you note that the United States government view, viewed the Betancourt government as the vanguard of the reformist forces in, in Latin America. And then also, can you please educate our, our audience on the Betancourt Doctrine, which you uh, discuss uh, in, in your book as well. Okay, yes, certainly. Uh, I think it's very interesting what you pointed out. Uh, it's important, it's really interesting to remember that during the 1940s, 1950s, and 60s, um, there was an interesting process of um, where the left-wing uh, political uh, parties and politicians, there was like a process of uh, where they were decanting, uh, essentially where uh, the most extremist uh, factions were essentially like identifying themselves and differentiating themselves from the more moderate a social Democrat left-wing politicians and parties in Latin America, okay? So that is a process that is happening at that time. So uh, there is a, some confusion at that time uh, in identifying who is who, especially in the left-wing uh, parties, Latin American parties and politicians at that time, okay? Uh, it's Interesting to remember that Betancourt, as a politician, when he was uh, much younger, he militated in the Communist Party of Venezuela. Uh, he had these, like, also Marxist uh, tendencies. Uh, he studied and read uh, Karl Marx, Das Kapital, for example. Um, so he himself passed through this process of maturing his ideas, his uh, political philosophy, and he essentially eventually uh, migrated to the moderate wings of the leftist, leftist parties and became a social democrat, okay? Uh, so from the point of view of the United States, there was misgiving uh, of Betancourt, Part of it was uh, came from uh, the propaganda uh, that came from the uh, dictatorship of Venezuela that painted Romulo Betancourt as an extremist, as a communist uh, uh, leader, essentially. Okay, um, and also it came from um, the part of the uh, inter entrepreneurs the American entrepreneurs who saw uh, the experience of the Trienio Adeco, where essentially they understood that Acción Democrática and that Romulo Betancourt and that Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso, they were nationalist, populist leaders who essentially were uh, represented, uh, yes, like this idea of uh, emancipation from the domination of, of, of the West, and especially from the point of view of economic policy, they were against this idea of neo-colonialism. So essentially, Acción Democrática represented these ideas of economic emancipation, 
of uh, more control over its own natural resources. Um, and that is something that the multinational companies from the United States, the Royal Dutch Shell as well from Europe, uh, they saw with great misgivings, okay? Um, so that is an interesting process. When Betancourt comes to power, there will be a phase of uh, prudence, uh, caution. They want to figure out uh, how Betancourt is going to behave. Will he be a new Gamal Abdel Nasser? Will he be essentially a Sukarno? Uh, and by this, I mean these two populist leaders who were kind of like socialist in their uh, perceptions, in their policies, or will Betancourt be more uh, condescendent to the interest of the United States? So essentially what will happen is a process where the United States will watch closely what is happening in Venezuela. Um, and in this, um, in, in this like labyrinth, uh, essentially the answer will come thanks to the Venezuelan Communist Party. This, this is something that I, I would argue. As the Venezuelan Communist Party becomes more belligerent, as it becomes more aggressive, as it uses violence, especially in the end of the 1906, of 1960, by November of 1960, it is recognized by the former guerrilla fighters in Venezuela and by Venezuelan historians that the Lucha Armada uh, begins, uh, the process of uh, yes, insurgency in Venezuela began in November of 1960. This will have like a great impact on the United States. Uh, in fact, on that same month, we have this beautiful quote uh, in a National Security Council meeting, President Eisenhower will say, wow, look at what is happening in Venezuela. I thought, I always believed that Betancourt was this leftist uh, politician and now, since he's, he's being attacked by the communists, I see him more as a right-wing uh, politician, okay? Uh, so essentially, that process of transformation uh, happens, and the Communist Party will push uh, help in pushing Venezuela closer to the United States um, in that process, okay? Uh, so when we discuss about the uh, private relationships, of course, they are very important in politics. Uh, for Betancourt, they were crucial. Uh, for example, he uh, catered uh, private relations with intellectuals from the United States. Here we can remember Francis Grant from Rutgers University or Robert J. Alexander. Mm -hmm. He catered relations with U.S. businessmen. Here we can remember, for example, Nelson Rockefeller, who was a very important um, a person from um, a Creole Oil Corporation in Venezuela, that is Standard Oil of New Jersey, the future Exxon uh, company. He also catered relations very important with labor leaders. Betancourt had great relations with the a American Federation of Labor, especially with Serafino Romualdi. He had great relations with some people in the State Department. Here we can remember Adolf Burley, who I mentioned uh, a, a while ago, Alan Stewart or Thomas Mann. And finally, we can also remember that Betancourt had great relations with some American politicians, and here, especially from Puerto Rico, eh, Muñoz Marín, Arturo Morales Carrion, and Teodoro Moscoso, the famous three who historians regard as the Puerto Rican group, okay? They were influential in determining U.S. foreign policy towards Latin America, okay? Uh, Teodoro Moscoso and Morales Carrion, they worked, for example, in the Alliance for Progress. Uh, so they were the mediators between Kennedy 
and Latin America in a certain sense. And I also rem uh, talked about the Latin American task force. Uh, it was made up of seven people knowledgeable about Latin America. Uh, for example, Arthur Whitaker, Lincoln Gordon, Richard Goodwin, okay? But the other, the next four people were close friends of Romulo Betancourt. So you see here again, the importance of the personal relations. I'm talking about Adolf Burley, Teodoro Moscoso, Arturo Morales Carrion, and Robert J. Alexander. They were all members of the Latin American task force as well. So that gives you an idea of how they, they knew Venezuela, they knew Betancourt, and they knew that uh, essentially in their conclusions, Venezuela was an important piece in the great puzzle of uh, U.S. Latin American uh, relations and policies, okay? okay? With regards to Kennedy, the relations, the personal relations were amazing. They were great uh, as witnessed, for example, by Edwin McCammon Martin, who was assist Assistant Secretary for Inter-American Affairs. Jacqueline Kennedy also wrote and said the same thing. Uh, the translator, Donald F. Barnes, also remembers that they, uh, Kennedy and uh, Betancourt shared the same ideals of the Alliance for Progress. Um, Alan Stewart and Venezuelan ambassador to the United States, Enrique Tejera Paris. They also acknowledge the great and warm relation, personal relation, re relations that were established between Kennedy and Betancourt. So this is important because, uh, as I wrote, for example, on the book, uh, citing uh, Enrique Tejera Paris, he said that these personal relations helped in um, opening up, especially the White House, um, they were well inclined towards Venezuela and towards uh, the Betancourt government. Okay, uh, so that was certainly a plus. We all know that U.S. foreign policy at that time, there are many levers in order to uh, garner the influence uh, in the United States. Uh, the two most important levers, I would say, are uh, the presidency and Congress. Um, and of course, having the White House well disposed towards Venezuela uh, was something that facilitated a lot uh, the work for uh, Venezuela and Acción Democrática. Okay, so that is one thing that I would, I would highlight and point out. With regards to the Betancourt doctrine, uh, yes, I mean, essentially, Betancourt understood that uh, the fledgling uh, new democracies could uh, essentially like uh, best survive if the other dictatorships were essentially isolated okay so the better Betancourt doctrine will is a name that comes from this pursuit of uh, from Romulo Betancourt and from uh, the foreign ministry of Venezuela at that time that essentially wanted to kick out from the OAS all de facto governments, all left-wing uh, left or right-wing dictatorships. In that endeavor, Venezuela did not succeed. The majority of the countries in Latin America did not want to adopt uh, this policy of excluding democracies from the OAS. So essentially, Venezuela started to apply this policy unilaterally. Venezuela broke off relations every time new coup d'etats happened in Latin America, and it broke off relations with uh, military governments. So that is what will be known as the Betancourt Doctrine. The uh, the other thing you mentioned that uh, large numbers of 
U.S. citizens were living in Venezuela during the 1960s. Um, and these were, of course, especially engaged in the petroleum industry and, I th and to some degree, the, the iron and, and steel industries. Petroleum has, has always entered into studies of Venezuelan politics and foreign relations. So can you uh, discuss how the sort of petro relations had changed during the, the course of the Cold War? Yes, yes, sure, certainly. Uh, re with regards to this uh, question, I think that, again, it's good to remember uh, uh, I mean, what Acción Democrática essentially stood for, okay? Acción Democrática, in a certain sense, um, was an exponent of the emancipation movement of the second half of the 20th century, okay? Uh, essentially, what happened uh, in the second half of the, of the 20th century was a process of, for example, decolonization in Asia, and in Africa, uh, uh, particularly. In the case of Latin America, when uh, Latin America had already gained its independence from colonialism, but it was struggling with what it saw as economic colonialism or what some people define as neo-colonialism. So essentially, Acción Democrática was very critical of uh, the great power and control that the oil companies had in Venezuela. They essentially uh, meddled uh, in Venezuela's political affairs, and they essentially get, uh, earned the lion's share of the profits from, uh, 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 from Venezuelan oil, okay? Acción Democrática saw this uh, as essentially these great multinational foreign companies that are exploiting uh, Venezuela's natural resources and that they were not giving back to the country their due, uh, th their due share of the profits. So this was the mindset of Acción Democrática f right from the very beginning. Uh, so essentially when they came to power uh, and they essentially um, sowed the democracy and established the democracy in Venezuela, they will pursue this policy that essentially will lead to a great divergence between the United States and Venezuela. Okay, uh, essentially, uh, Professor Tarber, you just talked about those 50,000 approximately US citizens that lived in Venezuela and these great private companies that were oper operating in the oil industry, but also uh, eventually also in the iron industry uh, that Venezuela will also develop. Uh, well, essentially, Acción Democrática will work uh, for that uh, like independence, okay? For Venezuela uh, gaining more control over its oil uh, and natural resources, um, and essentially, yes, establishing what we will know uh, and economists will uh, call uh, state capitalism, okay, where the state essentially takes over the ownership of those great uh, big companies, okay? So that is the policy that we will see play out. Uh, and essentially, uh, Acción Democrática will pursue that. First, during the famous triennio, okay, which will be from 1945 until 1948, okay, uh, Acción Democrática first through a de facto government and then through the constitutional government of Romulo Gallegos will lead this policy of vindication against the great power of the oil companies, okay. It will start to raise taxes and royalties on the companies. And then finally, in November of 1948, it will establish the famous 50-50, okay? A split um, in the distribution of the profits of the oil industry between the state and the private oil companies, okay? It's important also to note that the 50-50, I mean, what happens in Venezuela will have an impact 
internationally, okay? Essentially, um, yes, uh, Venezuela will be a pioneer, will be a, a leader of uh, oil nationalism uh, in, the, in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, the impact, the international impact of the 50-50 will be essentially that the oil producing countries in the Middle East, they will start to copy what Venezuela is doing uh, with its oil industry as well. And they will imitate and also adopt the 50-50 uh, system, okay? Then we have, of course, the period, the decade of the dictatorship. During that decade, we will see, um, for example, the new concessions um, that uh, the dictatorship will give to the private oil companies. So from this perspective, the dictatorship was not as we could say, quote, unquote, uh, hostile towards uh, the oil companies. But it is interesting also to remember that uh, in 1949 and 1950, the military dictatorship will start to, um, to start a process of uh, rapprochement with uh, the um, oil producing countries in the Middle East. So that is the situation that we will have when the Betancourt government comes in the early 1960s. Uh, he will again nominate Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso as his oil minister. And what we will see is the uh, policy, the interesting policy called the oil Pentagon, okay? Uh, the oil Pentagon was the policy, the oil policy that uh, the Betancourt government pursued, which essentially highlighted these five goals, the following five goals. In the first place, no more oil concessions would be given to the private companies in Venezuela. In the second place, there will be a, a, a pursuit for greater share in the oil profits, okay? And that is something that we uh, already happens essentially because the government of Edgar Sanabria had changed the 50-50 and increased the taxes to a 60-40 in um, favor of the Venezuelan state, okay? So that is uh, the second point of the oil Pentagon, greater share in oil profits. The third point uh, of the oil Pentagon will be the creation of the CVP, La Corporación Venezolana de Guayana, known as the Venezuelan Petroleum Corporation. For the first time, the, uh, the Venezuelan state uh, tries also to become an actor, a direct actor with its own, own oil company, um, the CVP. Okay, the fourth element will be the creation of the Oil Conservation Commission. Okay, this is an institution that Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso imitated from the Texas Railroad Commission. So again, we see here the state intervening more in uh, with the pretension of, inter of intervention, of greater intervention in the Venezuelan oil industry. And finally, we have uh, the creation of OPEC, okay, which will be huge also, which will have a huge impact uh, in uh, the oil um, industry worldwide, okay. Essentially, in April of, of 1959, in the Cairo conference, oil conference, Juan Pablo Perez Alfonso, Manuher Farman Farmayan from Iran, Abdullah Tariki from Saudi Arabia and the representatives, representatives of Kuwait and Iraq, they will sign the famous gentleman agreement that will lead a few months later in September of 1960 to the creation of OPEC. Okay, so that is one of the great things that uh, Acción Democrática will achieve 
in its intent uh, to emancipate um, Venezuelan economy from the domination of these great multinational Western companies. And it's a process that will continue throughout the Cold War. The process of divergence will continue. Uh, the Leoni and Caldera governments, they will essentially fight for um, the unilateral determination of the price of Venezuelan oil. And then finally, we will see in the mid-1970s, mm -hmm. Carlos Andres Perez nationalize uh, the oil industry. And in the 1980s, the government of, of Jaime Lucinchi will essentially acquire CIDGO here uh, in the United States. So we see that process. And for our American listeners, uh, the great big takeaway is this process of uh, divergence, I would say, that existed. We would not see that, for example, in Nigeria. Nigeria still has private, great big private oil companies operating inside their country. The path chosen in Venezuela was more nationalist, more populist, and it entailed this idea that the state had to control take over direct control of those companies and assume directly the business, uh, the oil business in Venezuela, okay? And, and you mentioned uh, that Carlos Andres Perez nationalized the, the petroleum industry, and I believe the year before he nationalized the iron and steel industry as, as well. Correct, and so yes. He, yes. Uh, he they, you know, they were moving towards that um, uh, that sort of, resumption of, uh, of the national resources that, that Venezuela had and, and, and could use for its own benefit. Um, yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, I know that our listeners will, uh, uh, will be uh, quite pleased uh, with uh, your, your discussion and the information that you have provided, and uh, we want to thank you for taking the time this afternoon to, uh, to speak with us. And uh, again, um, this, uh, uh, this work, uh, the, the podcast, is part of the efforts by the, uh, the, the Grupo de Estudios Venezuela, uh, Estados Unidos, and our, our outreach uh, to sort of promote both uh, uh, Venezuela and the United States, and, and in particular to promote uh, uh, the democratic governments that, um, that have existed in, in both of these countries. And I know that you are working right now on some... Uh, uh, research looking at uh, Venezuela and the United States uh, right mm -hmm. at, I believe, the, the sort of the, the, the beginning parts, uh, but at least during the, uh, the dictatorship, the Marcos Perez yeah. Jimenez uh, uh, dictatorship. And so our paths have crossed uh, uh, recently, uh, both of us doing work at the Truman Library uh, at yes. the same time, and it was, uh, it was a pleasure to, uh, to see you there. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, this will conclude our, our podcast, and um, uh, hopefully our listeners can, uh, uh, can take, uh, take some information from this. Okay. Um, right. hey, th thank you. Thank you both for having me, and I hope that this gives an idea of uh, a little bit of the history uh, during the 1960s uh, between uh, the United States and Venezuela. Uh, yes. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you.